Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And happy Constitution Day 2019. Thank you all for coming. All right, my job is done. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. I know it's super hot outside uh, and everybody's busy, especially this early in the semester. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Justin Word. I'm the director of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage. Um, and for those of you who don't know about the IACH, um, it's a really unique center here at OU, and very few colleges and universities have dedicated this many resources uh, to the study uh, of the Constitution. We offer, through the Department of Classics and Letters, the ability for undergraduates to minor or concentrate in constitutional studies, which uh, consists of uh, courses across uh, disciplines, history, political science, letters, for example. Um, we have a core group of faculty, uh, particularly Professor Katie Schumacher and Professor Andrew Poorwancher, who's not here today. And we have over 20 affiliated faculty uh, across the university, not only in the College of Arts and Sciences, uh, we have them in the School of Business, Education, and of course the Law School. But we're not only about uh, the education with a constitutional education of undergraduates, but we're also deeply committed uh, to civic and community outreach. Um, we do a teacher's institute in conjunction with another uh, program here uh, at OU, and starting this summer, we're going to restart a program uh, that was very popular a few years ago called Constitution Camp, where we bring some of our best scholars here at OU together uh, to give short 15 to 20 minute uh, presentations for the larger community uh, on constitutional issues. So that's very exciting. But the exciting thing today is that we have Professor Soterius Barber from Notre Dame to give our Constitution Day lecture. So I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, Professor Barber. Just as an aside, when I started my PhD program at Penn in 1998, and I said to uh, my professor at the time, I want to do constitutional theory, he said, this is where you start. And he handed me a book called On What the Constitution Means by Soterius Barber. So I literally started with Professor Barber. Uh, professor Barber is professor of political science at Notre Dame. Uh, and he is the author of a veritable cornucopia of the best books and articles in constitutional theory over the last 30 years. Uh, I won't go and name them all, but I have already named all what the Constitution means. I should also say in conjunction with uh, his co-authors, um, in my opinion, has also produced the best case book for undergraduates and first and second year law students who want to do constitutional theory. Um, he really has been uh, uh, a leader in constitutional theory, um, and in my opinion, uh, the best constitutional theorist in political science. Um, I won't talk anymore so we can hear from Professor Barber. I do want to say that uh, hold your questions, please, until he's finished. Uh, we'll have a student go around with a microphone, uh, and we can proceed that way. And for our affiliated faculty and the friends of IACH, there'll be a reception afterwards in the Regents Room, uh, which is on the third floor north side of the Union. So let's welcome Professor Barber. Well, let me start by uh, uh, thanking Professor Justin Wirt for that flattering introduction and for inviting me here. I want also to thank Ms. Amber Murray for making the arrangements, and thanks to all of you for uh, turning out. My remarks today concern the lost constitutionalism of the American founding and the future of the nation's constitutional democracy. To introduce this subject, I ask you to consider a problem with today's event, a problem with what we're supposed to be doing here today. Today is Constitution Day. 232 years ago today, Members of the Federal Convention in Philadelphia concluded their deliberations 
and signed the document that was to become the American Constitution. We're here to commemorate this signing event. Americans haven't always commemorated this event. In fact, September 17 was officially designated Constitution Day long after the Constitution's birth. Constitution Day was conceived by the late Senator Robert Byrd of West Virginia. Senator Byrd died in 2010 at age 92 after serving 51 years in the U.S. Senate, longer than anyone else to date. Senator Byrd authored an amendment to the Appropriations Act of 2005 that requires schools receiving, receiving federal funds to commemorate the forming and the signing of the Constitution. That's why we're here today. By holding this event, OU is obeying a law of Congress, meeting a condition for receiving federal money. That fact uh, deserves additional commentary, but I'll leave that aside. Uh, I'll leave aside the question of the constitutionality of Senator Byrd's amendment in order to uh, ask what that amendment requires us to do, because that's equally problematic. Senator Byrd had an exalted view of the American Constitution. He called it the foundation of our freedoms. He infused it with a kind of immortality. He said that these few pages written on parchment established for all time the direction and structure of these United States. He said he cared deeply about this precious document, and he summoned all Americans to take the time on September 17 to read, analyze, and reflect on the Constitution and the legacy of its quote-unquote heroic framers, namely the great treasure that is our nation and our form of government. In this way, he said, each of us can help discharge an obligation to hand this treasure on to future generations. Now, if we try to obey Senator Byrd's amendment to the Appropriations Act, we face a problem. For the amendment asks us to do incompatible things. Senator Byrd wanted us to commemorate not just the Constitution's founding, a series of events that including the signing ceremony of September 17, 1787. He also wanted us to commemorate what the founding ordained and established, namely the Constitution of 1788. But celebrating the founding of the Constitution is different from celebrating the constitutional document. The difference is an important difference. It's not a mere academic matter. It involves contrasting perspectives on the Constitution. It involves different relationships to the Constitution. It involves different attitudes toward the Constitution. And ultimately, it supposes and envisions different kinds of people. To commemorate the Constitution's founding, we commemorate crafting a document for the sake of ends like peace, justice, and prosperity. Viewed from the founding, the ends sought by the Constitution are external to and superior to both the constitutional document and the government that the document establishes. The idea of ends superior to law is, or at least was, integral to American constitutional thought. Thomas Jefferson expressed it in the Declaration of Independence. Alexander Hamilton expressed it in the first number of the Federalist Papers. And of course, the framers recorded it in the preamble to the Constitution of the United States. The preamble declares that the Constitution establishes a government for the sake of ends like union, the common defense, the general welfare, and the blessings of liberty. This is far from empty or innocuous language. In fact, one can doubt that on reflections, many Americans would choose this language today. Can add to that that very few uh, 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 professional students of the Constitution would choose this language today. 
Six justices of the United States Supreme Court effectively rejected this language in 1989. The case was DeShaney versus Winnebago. The DeShaney court said that Wisconsin, Wisconsin, the state of Wisconsin, had no constitutional duty to protect a four-year-old child from the perfectly predictable violence of his deranged father. The child was Joshua DeShaney. Randy DeShaney was Joshua's father. Randy had a habit of beating Joshua. He started beating him when he was three years old. Eventually, Randy beat Joshua into a permanently retarded state. This tragedy was predictable because on three separate occasions, emergency room physicians had informed a county child agency that the boy's father had beaten him to a point requiring hospitalization. After Randy had maimed Joshua for life, Joshua's mother, who had divorced Randy, sued the Child Welfare Agency for failing to protect the boy. She claimed that the agency's neglect of Joshua had violated the 14th Amendment. The Supreme Court disagreed. Case dismissed, said six justices of the U.S. Supreme Court. What has happened to poor Joshua is really tragic, they said, but the state of Wisconsin has no federal constitutional duty to protect the child. Ours is a constitution of negative rights, they said, not positive benefits like police protection. Negative rights are rights against the government, preventing government from abrid abridging freedoms of speech and religion, for example. Said the six justices, there are no rights to tax-supported benefits, once again, like police protection. How a democratic government apportions its resources, how it spends its money, is a matter of democratic choice, not constitutional duty, said the justices. A four-year-old child, no right to the state's protection against predictable violence. This holding is hard to swallow. It conflicts not only with the logic of the Constitution's preamble, it conflicts with the thought of American statesmen from Jefferson and Madison to Lincoln and through Lincoln to Franklin Roosevelt. But, sad to say, the DeShaney Doctrine is consistent with present-day views of democracy and limited government. And the Supreme Court has, firm, has reaffirmed the DeShaney Doctrine several times. Our constitutional rights are rights against our governments, not rights to governmental benefits, not even the benefit of police protection. Or so goes the constitutional thinking that currently controls the federal judiciary. Let me emphasize again that the Constitution says something different. Without mentioning anything about rights against the government, the Constitution's preamble lists good things like liberty's blessings, the general welfare, and the common defense. It implies that government is needed for the actual enjoyment of these good things, and it dedicates the national government to their pursuit. Most noteworthy, the preamble reads as if these good things are more important than the institutions established to pursue them. This message is no more than common sense. As a matter of ordinary practical reason, are ends not superior to their means? From a framer's view, from the view of September 17, 1787, the common defense, the general welfare, liberties, blessings, justice, and the like, these good things are superior to the institutions established to pursue them even if the institutions constitute a democracy. This is not just my account of the framers' view. In January 1788, five months before New Hampshire's ratification made the Constitution law, James Madison said in the Federalist Papers number 45 that, and I quote, the real welfare of the people is a supreme object to be pursued, and no form of government whatever 
has any value than as it may be fitted for the attainment of this object, end of quote. Madison seemed serious about this proposition. He applied it to the proposal of the Federal Convention, the document he signed 232 years ago today. He said, were the plan of government adverse to the public happiness, my voice would be, reject the plan. He added, were the union itself inconsistent with the public happiness, abolish the union, the very union that the Article, Articles of Confederation had declared to be perpetual. By reminding his readers that no form of government whatever is as important as the people's happiness, Madison wasn't speaking only for himself. This was the, um, this was the message of the American Revolution and the, what Madison called the transcendent law of nature and of nature's God. All this conflicts with the DeShaney Doctrine. It also conflicts with Senator Byrd's assumption that a man-made document could be the source of American freedoms or that any generation of Americans has an unqualified obligation to pass any form of government to future generations. Thus, to commemorate the founding is to revisit the perspectives of Madison, Hamilton, George Washington, and others who drafted the Constitution, signed it, and campaigned for its ratification. To commemorate the founding is to recall a point of view in which the Constitution is not the most important thing. From the founding's perspective, the Constitution is essentially a set of means, means to a good life for its people. But all this changed on June 21st, 1788. On that day, New Hampshire became the ninth state to ratify the Constitution. The Constitution was now more than the proposed set of means. Now it was law. Now the focus shifted from the good things listed in the Constitution's preamble to Article 6 and its famous Supremacy Clause. This clause declares that the Constitution and the laws of the United States shall be made, which shall be made in pursuance thereof shall be the supreme law of the land. Our concern now is not the good things in view of which the Constitution is a set of means. Now we're concerned with a law, a law that binds, a law that binds everyone, even if some deny that it's working to promote the good things listed in the preamble. Here then is our problem this afternoon. If we commemorate the Constitution, we stand under the Constitution. Our attitude is one of respect for the law, and our virtue is the virtue of law-abidingness. If, on the other hand, we commemorate the founding, we stand over the Constitution. We celebrate the subordination of legal authority to intrinsically desirable ends, and we admire the virtues requisite to the pursuit of those ends. A vestige of this attitude persisted in Senator Burns, Byrd's call to commemorate the founding. He spoke of the Constitution's framers as heroic framers, and indeed they were heroic. They were not ordinary law-abiding citizens like you and me. They fixed their eyes not on the law, but on the ends of government, public goods, social conditions, states of society like national security and national prosperity. Their concern for the Constitution of their day, the Articles of Confederation, was not how to follow it, but how to replace it, lawfully if possible, unlawfully if necessary. The founding generation replaced its original Constitution because it wasn't working. When I say the Constitution wasn't working, what I mean is that the government that the Constitution established, that, the, that the, Consti the original Constitution established wasn't working. The government wasn't working. The Confederation Congress was not working to secure America's credit abroad, a vital element of national security. 
It wasn't working to open the Mississippi River to American shipping. It wasn't working to maintain a stable currency and the confidence of, confidence of investors. It wasn't working to prevent domestic disorders like Shays' Rebellion and economic conflict among the states that could eventuate in civil war and even a return to foreign domination, a concern of the age. So America's founding fathers disestablished their first constitution and to do so, they had to act outside the law of their day. You all know the story. Amending the Articles of Confederation required unanimous consent of the 13 states. This requirement made amendments practically, practically impossible, so the framers ignored it. In convention 232 years ago today, they signed a new constitutional proposal. This proposed constitution would go into, go into effect upon ratification by only nine of the 13 states and only among the states that were ratifying the Constitution. The framers, thus, the framers then sent the proposal Constitution to the Federation, Confederation Congress to be forwarded to the state legislatures and ultimately to state ratifying conventions. These ratifying conventions represented not the state governments but the state's electorates. And the convention eventually adopted the new Constitution in the name not of the state governments but in the name of their constituents. All this was accomplished not just against the law of the Union, but outside the law, outside the laws of the 13 states. You might even say that all this was done in defiance of political morality. In 1861, some 73 years after ratification, Americans began a civil war. They began a civil war to stop 11 of 31 states from leaving the Union. Yet, in 1788, the framers and the people who followed them were prepared to expel from the Union as many as four of the original 13 states, ready to expel some despite the mutual promise of perpetual, perpetual Union among all some seven years before. Such was the effect of establishing the new Constitution upon the ratification of the ninth state. This event simultaneously dissolved the old Union and excluded from the new Union, perhaps temporarily, perhaps not, those states that had yet to ratify the new Constitution. Paradox thus marks today's proceedings. We celebrate a law that claims to be supreme law at the same time that we celebrate an act that violated the laws of this day, of its day. Were Senator Byrd here this afternoon, he might disagree. He might say that we can celebrate both the founding and the Constitution without conflict because the act of founding our present Constitution was performed with sufficient wisdom to eliminate the need for further founding acts. Senator Byrd wouldn't have to mean the impossible he wouldn't have to mean that the framers created a perfect constitution, for the constitution itself implies otherwise by allowing for amendments via Article 5, which prescribes ways to amend the constitution, a provision that a perfect constitution wouldn't need. But Senator Byrd's response would assume at least two things. First, that Article 5 is adequate to any reform that the American people might need, and second, that like the founding generation, all generations of Americans would have what it takes, the wisdom and the political unity, to effect reforms that they in fact did need. Only if Senator Byrd believed these things could he envision a secure, equitable, and free nation stretching into an indefinite future in accordance with the provisions of a founding act. Only if we believe both in the adequacy of Article 5 and in our continuing ability as a nation to reform our institutions could we celebrate both the founding and the Constitution in a manner free of conflict. Yet who can look at the present shape of American politics and say either that Americans can still accomplish major institutional reform 
or they can realistically hope for reform through the procedures of Article 5. Maybe some of us can, but I doubt that most of us, uh, most of us can, and therefore I deny that we can do on this day what Senator Byrd wanted us to do. If we're serious about what we're doing here this afternoon, we must choose between commemorating the founding and commemorating the, the Constitution. We cannot, in reason, commemorate both. Not at the same time, anyway. Now, I'm going to step out on a limb and propose that we commemorate the founding. I propose that we recall its principles and its virtues with admiration and as object lessons for the country's present situation. Though what I'm proposing is almost surely an exercise in wishful thinking, I propose it nonetheless. My reasons begin with the public opinion polls. Public trust in the U.S. government has declined more or less steadily over the past 60 years, from around 73% in December of 1958 to around 17% at the end of last March. By contrast, public support for the U.S. Constitution has remained consistently higher than public support for the national government. When support for the government dipped to 15% in 2010, unqualified support for the Constitution stood at 74%. Yet support for the Constitution has begun to wane. From 2010 to 2012, it dropped five points to 69%. And today, it stands at around 50 points, a drop of 24% in nine years. These are crude figures. Uh, they fall far short of proof that the Constitution is failing, but they do support an important hypothesis. They suggest that the public's attitude toward the national government will eventually affect public attitudes toward the Constitution. If Americans continue to believe that their government isn't working, they'll eventually believe that the Constitution isn't working. This is as it was under the Articles of Confederation and as it should be under our present Constitution. For the Constitution is more than a collection of restraints on government. The Constitution is primarily a plan of government. And if the government isn't working, the plan isn't working. As trust and confidence in the government continue to decline, we can expect more of what we're seeing now decline in support for the plan of the government. You may think that this is unfair, that it's unfair to blame the Constitution for a failing government. Who blames the law for departures from the law? Some Americans hold that the national government is broken largely because for the last 80 years or so, it has vastly exceeded its original powers. It has been trying to do more than the framers designed it to do. Although this is a common view among Americans, it ignores important facts. The Constitution's framers told the nation that the Constitution arrangements of offices and powers would be up to the challenges of America's future, and that checks and balances would prevent the states and the national governments from exceeding their limitations. If our governments have disappointed these expectations, if in some respects they are attempting too much or in other respects not enough, then the framers' plan is defective and Americans face the prospect they faced 232 years ago, namely constitutional, it's constitutional failure. So we return to the question, can Americans meet the challenges of a dysfunctional government as their political ancestors did 232 years ago. Who can answer yes? Who can seriously believe that our generation can come within a mile of what the founding generation accomplished? In fact, James Madison himself denied that future generations could repeat the achievements of his generation. The main reason, he said, toward the end of the Federalist Number 49, the main reason was partisanship. 
attempts at constitutional change by future generations, generations would be governed by the very partisanship that created the need for constitutional change. Our experience confirms Madison's prediction. Extreme partisanship has created a dysfunctional Congress and brought public approval of that body to below 25% for almost a decade. The last report that I saw had public approval of Congress at 17%. Yet blind partisanship in Congress reflects divisions among the broader public, the very divisions that rule out changing things like partisan gerrymandering, a seriously malapportioned Senate and Electoral College, dark money in politics, and other pathologies. But alas, partisanship isn't the only reason we can't do what the framers did. Another reason is not what divides Americans, but what to a large extent unites them. Beliefs about constitutional government that are broadly shared among Americans, liberals, as well as conservatives. Due to these broadly shared beliefs and attitude, attitudes, changing the Electoral College and the Senate's apportionment, dismantling the role of money in, uh, in, uh, in politics, and other structural reforms would probably accomplish little by way of good government, by way of the kind of government that Americans could support. And this brings us back to the DeShaney case. The prevailing view of constitutional government is what the Supreme Court implied in the DeShaney case. This view separates the Constitution from its ends. It holds that, con that the Constitution's chief purpose is not a desirable state of society, but a desirable governmental arrangement, a system of federated democracies. This system enables electoral majorities to pursue whatever ends they want, except as restrained by negative rights and the structural boundaries between the branches and the levels of the nation's governments. On the whole, the Constitution is seen as a mechanism for aggreg aggregating private preferences, hence the decision in the DeShaney case. The state of Wisconsin had a federal constitutional duty to avoid specified private harms, like abridging speech or punishing people without fair trials. It had no federal constitution to do good beyond maintaining a system for registering private preferences in the formation of public policy. As long as the state played no active role in what happened to poor Joshua, it had no federal constitutional duty to protect him from his father, though it would have been good had the state done so. The majority in Joshua's case, the six justices, included one liberal justice and two or three moderate conservatives. This lineup placed the decision in the juridical mainstream. Nonetheless, to repeat, the framers had a different view of the Constitution. Their Constitution also served an aggregating function to be sure. It aggregated private preferences and brought them to bear on the formation of public policy. But the Framers' Constitution served a more important function, a more important function than aggregating private preferences. The highest function of the Framers' Constitution was education, elevation, if you will. Not just gathering public preferences, but elevating public preferences, raising the public up from its unreflective inclinations and prejudgments to an appreciation of its true interest. Hear Alexander Hamilton on this point in the second paragraph of the Federalist Number 71. If I had to pick one paragraph of the Federalist Number 71 as the most important paragraph, even more important than the Federalist Number 10, any paragraph in the Federalist Number 10, I would pick this paragraph. I, well, I would. Uh, this paragraph would be either number one or number two. I'll read either number one or two, number two in a minute. In the Federalist Number 71, Hamilton described how he expected the American presidency to work. I dwell on this passage at length because of its implications 
not only for the presidency, but for constitutional government as a whole, and because of its clear relevance to the present state of American politics. Hamilton says in this paragraph that people who see the president as the pliant servant of either Congress or the American public entertain very crude notions of both the purposes of government and the true means for promoting the public happiness. Though democratic principles demand the deliberate sense of the community should prevail, uh, should govern the conduct of those to whom they entrust the arrangement of their affairs, he says, democratic principles do not require unqualified complacence to every sudden breeze of passion or transient impulse which the people may receive from men who flatter their prejudices or betray their interests. The people commonly intend the public good, says Hamilton, but their good sense would despise the adulator who should pretend that they always reason the right about the means of promote, promoting it. They know from experience that they sometimes err. And the wonder is that they so seldom err as they do, beset as they continually are, by the wiles of parasites and sycophants. When occasions present themselves in which the interests of the people are at variance with their inclinations, it is the duty of the persons whom they have appointed to be the guardians of those interests to withstand the temporary delusion in order to give them time and opportunity for more cool and sedate reflection. Instances might be cited in which a conduct of this kind has saved the people from the very fatal consequences of their own mistakes and has procured lasting monuments of their gratitude to the men who had the courage and magnanimity enough to serve them at the peril of their displeasure. Now this is an important paragraph. This paragraph conveys the essence of the framers' constitutionalism. Let's look at it again a little bit. Let's unpack it a little bit to see what some of its implications are. People commonly intend the public good. At some level, it seems, Matt, uh, Hamilton assumed, at some level, each of us realizes that the liberties we value are liberties in a social organization, liberties in a community, and that even as individuals, we have a stake in the good of this social organization. Thus, do people commonly intend public goods like those listed in the preamble. Yet people commonly know, you and I, according to Hamilton, commonly know that sometimes what they think they want turns out to be other than what they really want. To meet this problem, people establish a government that they can entrust to promote their interest against their inclinations if need be. This government has a duty to promote the public's true interest. And where government is electorally accountable, this is a duty to make the public sensible of its true interest. When such turnarounds occur, when such turnarounds in public opinion occur, people build monuments of gratitude to courageous and magnanimous political leaders. In this passage, from the, as, as I say, that's the essence of, of, uh, of the framers' constitutionalism, a constitutionalism that turns on the difference between the public's true interests and the public's inclinations, a constitutionalism that supposes that public opinion can be mistaken, and furthermore, that the public is sufficiently aware of this to establish a government to meet this continuing problem. In this passage from the 71st Federalist, Hamilton also identifies the greatest threat to the framers' constitutionalism. That threat is demagoguery. Demagogues tell the public that it's always right about its true interest. Demagogues deny the distinction between the public's interest and the public's inclination, between what the public wants at any given moment and what it ought to want what it would want if it could rise above its prejudgments long enough to look around and think straight. By denying the distinction between the public interest and the public in in inclinations, demagogues strike at the very heart of the framers' constitutionalism. 
Finally, Hamilton also identifies the ultimate safeguard against demagoguery, a public that despises political parasites and sycophants, politicians who pretend that voters always know best. From this, we can infer that the test of a good constitution is whether its government cultivates and maintains a political culture that elevates to political office persons who are wise and courageous enough to pursue the public's true interests, not its prejudices or its momentary inclinations. This, this, uh, uh, this uh, inference from what Hamilton says is confirmed by Madison in a paragraph in the Federalist number, in, in, in the Federalist number 57, third paragraph, if anyone's interested. In sum, these are the fundamentals of the framers' constitutionalism. Everything else is derivative and contingent. Separation of powers, federalism, other institutions, these things have value only so long as they work to promote the people's welfare. Hence, Madison's grand declaration, Federalist Number 45, the real welfare of the people is the supreme object and no form of government whatever has any value other than its service to this object. Well, now clearly, the nation has all but lost this old constitutionalism. Most Americans, including most constitutional scholars, hold that the Constitution designs a government to reflect public opinion, not shape it or direct it toward the truth. For, according to most uh, uh, constitutional scholars, uh, according to most social scientists, there is no truth, at least about the common good, beyond public opinion. Ours is a constitution of negative rights, it is said, not positive benefits. Liberty from government with no constitutional right to the blessing, blessings of liberty in a well-governed society. No constitutional right even to police protection for a four-year-old child in a situation that the authorities knew to be dangerous. Negative constitutionalists admit that the Constitution preamble lists positive social ends, but they hold that the meaning and the weight of these ends are matters of democratic choice, not constitutional imperative. They hold that at bottom, public policy is and should be what the electorate wants or thinks it wants, not what some deep state bureaucrats or self-righteous academics say the electorate ought to want. This thinking about what's good has affected the new constitutionalist thinking even about what's right. It's affected new constitutionalist thinking about the meaning of constitutional rights. Influential new constitutionalists, William Rehnquist, Robert Bork, maybe even John Roberts, influential new constitutionalists have long held that constitutional rights like free speech and equal protection owed their existence not to what some transcendental source, dis uh, not, to, not to some transcendental source discovered by reason judgment, but solely to the fact that once upon a time, some popular majority enacted them into law. Accordingly, say the new constitutionalists, the meaning of constitutional rights depend mostly on how the people who enacted them defined or applied them. This understanding of constitutional meaning goes under the name of originalism. Demagoguery finds a home in this new constitutionalism. Because the new constitutionalism, uh, new constitutionalism recognizes no standard of goodness or rightness beyond public opinion, it has no real basis for condemning the demagogue's manipulation of public opinion. If there is no outside reality for opinions to correspond to, it's not clear either what manipulation of public opinion can mean or why manipulation of public opinion is wrong. Without an outside reality, the soundness of an opinion depends on its staying power, and there's no reason for open-mindedness and moderation. There's no real reason for evidence and logic no reason for withholding judgment till all the facts are in. No reason to admit a mistake. No reason for any of that stuff. This new constitutionalism is very powerful because powerful forces support it. 
These forces include academic institutions like value neutrality in the human sciences and academic doctrines that deny the existence of a moral reality and even in the extreme a material, a material reality beyond opinion. More powerful support comes from an economic philosophy committed to liberty against nature through technology and economic growth through the relaxation of moral and aesthetic constraints on consumption. As powerful as the new constitutionalism is, however, its decline is assured by the hard facts of humanity's situation in the world, a world that has proved to be beyond human control. One example should suffice. Global warming looms. If no person on Earth acknowledges the facts of global warming, if none endures the sacrifice needed to avoid its worst effects, those effects will still come. A constitutionalism that reduces truth to opinion, scorns moral and intellectual competence as elitism, and promotes self-assertion and self-indulgence over self-criticism and self-restraint, this new constitutionalism has little chance against problems like global warming, unequal opportunity, and advancing oligarchy. I've argued that we should commemorate the American founding, not the Constitution that it founded. I've argued this because the latter is failing the objectives of the former. I've tried to show that the constitutionalism of the founding was a positive constitutionalism, not the negative constitutionalism that prevails to date. Another way of putting it, I've tried to show that the constitutionalism is an ends-oriented constitutionalism, not the constitutionalism of rights that uh, uh, prevails uh, uh, today. Now, an argument against my position could begin with an appeal to liberty. It could claim that a government that isn't working may be a problem, but it's not a constitutional problem. And it's not a constitutional problem because it's no threat to liberty. Since constitutional liberty is liberty from government. A government that isn't working, at least you can say about a government that isn't working, is that it isn't working to threaten liberty. Now, lest you think that no one holds this view of liberty and that I'm erecting a straw man, I ask you to read the DeShaney case. For a different view of liberty, once again, consult the Constitution's preamble and the first Federalist. If liberty meant first and foremost liberty from government as opposed to liberty from private power, no sane person would have established government in the first place. No sane person would have established government for the sake of liberty. Yet the Constitution's preamble says that we are establishing government for the sake of liberty, or to be precise, for the sake of liberty's blessings. And the first Federalist, fifth paragraph, in the first Federalist, fifth paragraph, Alexander Hamilton says that the vigor of government is essential to the security of liberty, and that in a sound and well-informed judgment, their interests can never be separated. Joshua DeShaney's case illustrates Hamilton's point. Though Wisconsin didn't encourage Randy, Joshua's father, though Wisconsin didn't dis dis uh, encourage or force Randy to destroy Joshua's chances for a life of reasonable li liberty, the state knew that Randy was endangering Joshua's chances for such a life and that Joshua couldn't stop him. Joshua's chance with chances for a self-directed life, Joshua's chances for a life in liberty, depended on a state that, for whatever reason, got there too late. Though the Founders' constitutionalism makes sense and the Constitution of Negative Liberties makes no sense, returning to the Founders' constitutionalism won't be easy. Recognizing an affirmative constitution, constitutional to protect, protect children from violence, and you'll soon be talking about a constitutional duty to protect them from undeserved hunger, ignorance, and other threats to their chances of lives 
chances for lives of responsible liberty. As I pointed out, powerful forces oppose this idea. But if returning to the founder's constitutionalism would be difficult, difficult doesn't mean impossible. A feature of the nation's present political situation may make commemorating the founding a bit more than an exercise in wishful thinking. I refer to our use of the words, our ordinary, everyday use of the words demagogue and demagoguery. Today, people on the left regularly complain about right-wing demagoguery, and people on the right regularly complain about left-wing demagoguery. Charges of demagogue ring across the nation's political landscape. That's regrettable, of course, but there is some reassurance in it. When we complain about demagogues, we make assumptions that the framers shared. These assumptions concern the functions of constitutional government. Complaints about demagoguery assume a difference between what the public thinks it wants and what the public ought to want, namely the public's true interest. Complaints about demagogues also assume that responsible politicians work for the latter, work for, what the, public, work for the public's true interest, and not the former, the public's mere inclinations. These assumptions coincide with Hamilton's view of constitutional leadership at its best, leadership that educates the public to its true interest. People who harbor these assumptions can agree with Madison that no form of government whatever has any other value than as it may be fitted for the attainment of this object, this object being what Madison called the real welfare of the great body of the people. Federalist number 45, second paragraph. Old beliefs thus persist. Despite the forces arrayed against these old beliefs, they persist. They persist because it's hard to deny the distinction between truth and opinion. It's hard to deny that truth refers to a reality external to opinion. It's hard to deny that this reality has moral as well as material dimensions. And it's hard to deny that we human beings hold truth to be more attractive than opinion. These old beliefs ground the framers' constitutionalism. They persist in the teeth of very powerful forces. This persistence justifies some hope for the nation's future, and that's the reason for commemorating the American founding. We have time for a few questions. Sir, the uh, Declaration also speaks of the ends of government, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. As I understand uh, Lincoln, he believed that the spirit of the Declaration, particularly the, declara the idea that all men are created equal, should, should uh, direct our understanding of the Constitution. Uh, they were related, as he used to uh, speak, as a frame to the picture. How, uh, would you agree, and how does that fit into your presentation yes. today? Uh, I, you know, I, I, I thought of bringing a copy of, of, uh, of Lincoln's uh, speeches with me because I should have anticipated this question. I, I would certainly agree. To my mind, uh, this is going to sound ridiculous, but to my mind, uh, the, the greatest speech that Lincoln made uh, was not the Gettysburg Address. I mean, looking at it from the point of view of a student of the Constitution. The most important speech that Lincoln made was not the Gettysburg Address or the Second Inaugural Address. To my mind, I'm in the minority, the most important speech that he made was his speech, a special message to Congress of July 4, 1861. Uh, and in this special message to Congress, uh, he, he elaborates, he, he interprets the passage in the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal. And this is how he interprets it. Uh, this is almost verbatim. If somebody has one of these things that you hold in your hand, maybe you can pull it up, pull up the speech, what, the iPhone, right? 
uh, uh, you, can, you can pull it up. But this is almost verbatim. He says that the leading object of our government, the leading object of our government, is to lift artificial weights from all shoulders and give to each person an equal chance in the race of life. So that's his sort of operational interpretation of the idea that all men are created equal. The, the idea that all men are created equal uh, uh, does say some things about government. It says, for example, that slavery is immoral, but, it, but, it, uh, but what Lincoln did in this speech was he developed it, what we could call its further operational implications. And its further operational implications it was that the American Constitution is committed to a certain set of public policies. And this set of public policies uh, would go under the general title of equal opportunity, equal opportunity. So yes, I would definitely uh, uh, in, in, uh, endorse that as consistent with the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the framers' uh, constitutionalism. There's been a lot written on this subject. The best book on this subject is uh, Harry Jaffa's book, Crisis of the House Divided. I think, what was that, 1959, somewhere along in there, Crisis of the House Divided, where Jaffa points out this passage in Lincoln's speech and uh, 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 relates that to the philosophy of the, of the American Founding Fathers and also to the philosophy of, of John Locke. Um, to, go, to go along with the whole concept of constitutional failure, um, would you say that we're currently in a constitutional crisis right now? Oh, definitely. And it's going to get worse. Yes. <laughs> what can I say? Indeed. Yes, we are, we are the, in a constitutional crisis. Yes, indeed. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? <laughs> can you elaborate on that a little bit? I'm, I'm trying to keep my remarks uh, 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 sort of nonpartisan. Uh, I'm not doing a very good job. Uh, but if I were to answer, if I were to answer your question, I would do even a less good job. But I mean, when it comes to the point, for example, where um, uh, I mean, you asked me, all right. So let me just give you a short answer and let it go. I don't want to. I don't want to dismiss the question. Uh, uh, when it comes to the point where a, uh, a member of the executive branch is deliberately obstructing a congressional subpoena, that's a crisis. That's a crisis. That's, that's one part of, of, a, of a lengthy answer. I mean, if you take a look at what I've said, if everything turns, if everything turns on the distinction between what people think is right and what is really right, a lot of philosophers deny that there is any such distinction. But then again, a lot of philosophers deny that there is any distinction between what we see in the outside world and what we want to see in the outside world. Now, a lot of philosophers deny these distinctions. A lot of philosophers affirm these distinctions. The philosophic community is divided on, on the questions of scientific skepticism and moral skepticism. But if you take the American Constitution seriously, then ordinary common sense prevails. If you take the American Constitution seriously, there is a difference between what's true and false, and there is a difference between what's right and wrong. And if there is a difference between what's true and false, and if there is a difference of what's truly right and what's truly wrong, then officials who systematically misrepresent the truth, officials who systematically talk in terms of, what's the expression? Alternative realities. 
this practice strikes at the very heart of constitutional government. And indeed, yes, definitely a crisis. Given that we're in a crisis, uh, what do we do? What we should do? Yeah, like an, a realistic, actual something for each of us in this room to you know, do. Don't, don't ask me that. <laughs> don't ask me that. I'm from Notre Dame, and what I do is pray for the second coming. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what to do. I, 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 uh, but, but the first thing, the, the, the first step in doing anything is to recognize what the problem is. First of all, to recognize that we indeed have a problem and to recognize what the problem is. Now, uh, do I think there's any chance of a, uh, do I think there's any chance of a lawful turnaround? No. I don't think there's any chance of a lawful turnaround. That doesn't argue for revolution of any kind. I'm not arguing for revolution. But suppose an asteroid hits. Suppose the second coming comes in the form of an asteroid. Suppose an asteroid hits. We may have a chance to do things over again. And if we do have a chance to do things over again, it would help to know what we did wrong in the first place. Well, I've got a question. Um, so you mentioned the DeShaney case and specifically the Constitution. You know, allows... I'm a little hard of hearing, and I know you've got a mic, but maybe you could move the mic a little bit farther from your mouth. And... Gotcha. Okay. You mentioned the DeShaney case, and specifically the Constitution um, kind of delegates policing powers to the state. So if the state, was it Wisconsin? Okay, yes, if the state Wisconsin. of Wisconsin was constitutionally required to police that case, would that open liability um, <clears throat> of specific government failures in terms of the criminal justice system, would that open liability um, to all those states then? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure that I, that, that I, I, I uh, be, because of the position of the mic, I'm not sure that I understand the question. Let me take a stab at the question. Sure. Are you saying that one of the reasons for the decision in the DeShaney case was to avoid flooding the federal courts with uh, tort claims in the states with, uh, I mean, because we can always complain about what the state governments do, and had the DeShaney court opened the floodgates, then the federal courts would have been inundated by complaints from the states? Yes. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, I'm wondering if, if, if they maybe set that precedent of negative rights out of fear of maybe opening a whole new realm of what might come. Yes, yes, that, that, is, definitely, that is definitely an aspect of the, uh, of the DeShaney decision. And that, uh, that aspect of it, to my mind, uh, explains to me why uh, Justice O'Connor went along with it, because Justice O'Connor was a conservative, but she was a moderate conservative, very much interested in states' rights. Uh, it explains to me why Justice Stevens went along with it. Justice Stevens wasn't all that interested in states' rights, but Justice Stevens would certainly be interested in avoiding flooding the federal courts with God knows how many cases from the opening the floodgates to these kinds of cases in the federal courts. Yes, these, this was an aspect of the, uh, of the case. But the man who wrote the majority opinion was Chief Justice William Rehnquist. Chief Justice Rehnquist was a very clever man, very, very smart man. And what he did was he took the occasion of this case and this particular complication that you're talking about, he took the occasion of this case to write a dissertation, uh, 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 a dissertation on the nature of the Constitution, a dissertation that recorded what was at that time uh, uh, the Republican, uh, the, uh, the Republican ideology, libertarian ideology, the, the limited government ideology. And as a result of the manner in which he wrote the opinion, bringing these kinds of complications in at the periphery, but not in terms of the core message, as a result of the manner in which he wrote the opinion, um, 
the case has been received as, a, uh, uh, as an argument for the negative constitution. Now, there isn't any defense of the negative constitution. It's simply, it's simply proclaimed, it's declared that ours is a negative constitution, a constitution of negative liberties. So yes, this is a complication, and this explains some of the DeShaney case. But the core message of the DeShaney case, as received by the legal profession, as received by the popular press, Linda Greenhouse, uh, uh, Joshua DeShaney died at age 36 uh, in, in 2015. And Linda Greenhouse, uh, wrote a, an op-ed piece on the death of Joshua DeShaney, and uh, there were a number of obituaries on Joshua DeShaney written in other uh, places, and they all understand DeShaney versus Winnebago as a theoretical statement for the idea that our Constitution guarantees no uh, uh, benefits. What our Constitution guarantees is, uh, well, for the most part, our Constitution guarantees no benefits. There is, a, there is an exception. The exception is, is slavery. Our Constitution guarantees that the government will stop one private person from enslaving another private person. Um, uh, but with that exception, with the exception of chattel slavery, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, there is no um, unqualified, there is no unqualified guarantee of the benefits that uh, uh, we pay our officials to provide for us. There is no, uh, 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 there is no constitutional guarantee of, natu uh, of national defense. The, uh, according to DeShaney versus Winnebago, the government has, does not have a duty to defend the nation, which of course is just mind boggling. I mean, the government may choose to defend the nation, but it has no constitutional duty to do so. One more, we have time for one more question. Thanks. Um, do you believe the Constitution is a living document, like it should change as society changes? Yes, I believe the Constitution is a living document to be sure, but, but, I, but, but my understanding of that may not be your understanding of that. Um, the, uh, let's, say, let, let's take the due process clause. Are you a student in constitutional studies? You know what the due process clause is? Okay, the due process clause says that no person shall be deprived of liberty without due process of law, and the question is, what does liberty mean? Now, the word liberty in the due process clause is not, is not in quotation marks. The word liberty, if it refers to anything at all, refers to liberty. The question then is, what is liberty? Let's take an analogous, an analogous question. Let's say that we, uh, that we want to know what a frog is. Uh, there can be a lot of misunderstandings about what a frog is. Some people can believe that frogs are slimy green messengers of the devil. Um, uh, and I'm sure that if you were to talk to a biologist, they could say that there are there, still some questions of precisely what a frog is. But we do believe that the word frog picks out a thing in the world, a thing in the world, a thing that would be here even if we weren't here, a thing in the world, and that uh, the, uh, the path to discovering what that thing is is called science. Well, the same might be true, some philosophers are arguing and have argued for the last 60 years. The same might be true of the word liberty. If the word liberty refers to, to anything, it doesn't refer to a definition of liberty. Why? Because a definition of liberty is a definition of liberty. 
It doesn't refer to an example of liberty. Why? Because an example of liberty is an example of liberty. If there is no liberty, then there can't be a definition of it. If there is no liberty, then there can't be an example of it. Okay, what then is it? Now, my answer would be, or the answer to which I subscribe, is the answer given by a group of philosophers called moral realists, moral realists. And I think it's fair to say that this is not some fringe group of moral philosophers. This is the dominant, uh, 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 this is, this is, this uh, philosophic position dominates in the philosophy departments of the United States and um, uh, the English speaking world, probably elsewhere as far as I know. But, but this philosophy says something like this that the word liberty, and, and similar words like justice, decency, fairness, things like this, that these words refer to real things and their nature, the nature of these real things, analogously to the nature of a frog, the nature of these things is discovered through essentially a truth-seeking process. And that truth-seeking process is called, uh, uh, well, the Supreme Court, uh, the justices of the Supreme Court call this truth-seeking process reasoned judgment. Reasoned judgment. Uh, it's uh, uh, reasoned judgment has the same logical structure as scientific method, the same logical structure as scientific method. So I would say that the word liberty doesn't change its meaning. It refers to what it always referred to. It referred to what the framers thought it would refer to. And incidentally, I can back this up by passages from the Federalist Number 78, and that courts have an obligation to continue to think about the meaning of a word's liberty in changing social circumstances. So that would be, uh, that would be the manner in which I would subscribe to the idea of a living constitution. There's a different idea of living constitution. The different idea of living constitution is that words change their meaning through the passage of time. I don't think there's any way you can defend that idea of living constitution. If you want to see the idea of living constitution that's a sound idea of living constitution, read John Marshall's opinion in McCulloch versus Maryland. Let's thank Professor Barber. Thank you. Thank you.